Tonight, Panorama investigates the multi-billion pound deals hidden from the taxpayer, threatening the future of our hospitals. It has been a rip-off. We've paid far more than we needed to. Deals that aren't always what they seem. Was Liverpool a fix? Yes, I believe so. And I think ministers should have asked some tough questions about this project. Deals that sometimes test the patience of the public. What do you make of that? It's barking. Barking. And deals that have allowed a small group of companies and private financiers to make a killing from the taxpayer. The Daily Telegraph of the 28th of January reported you as getting pay and dividends of £8.6 million pounds last year. Is that correct? That's correct. Deals that will affect our schools, hospitals and public services for decades to come. Across the country, a new power is making its presence felt. Unelected and unaccountable. It's 10 p.m. in Shipley, Yorkshire. The new Titus Salt School is lit up like a Christmas tree. All night long, the lights blaze away at this school, holiday and term time. A neighbor opposite says she has to wear an eye mask to get to sleep. Some school budgets are falling, yet this school's electricity bill is going up in smoke. Now the green thing to do is for the last person who leaves to turn out the lights. But you can't at this school. It was built without light switches. But why? I wanted a simple answer to this simple question. I asked the school, then the local authority, then the firm that maintains the school, even the PR firm they employed to handle my inquiry. No one was prepared to shed light on this mystery. Welcome to the surreal world of a government scheme called the Private Finance Initiative, PFI. <laughs> The sway of PFI is growing, but some of its customers are far from happy. This junior football club in Worksop used to train at the local school. In 2007, that school got taken over by a PFI company. Prior to PFI, we were spending less than £2,000 a year on uh, pictures and facilities. And uh, You mean booking pictures and that sort yes, of thing? Yes, indeed, yeah. Uh, and uh, last season it uh, was just short of 4000 This season it will be uh, in the order of four and a half to 5000 So it's more than doubled more than since doubled, PFI. Yeah. Yes, and we've seen the cost to these players go up from £60 a year to £90 a year to cover that. The PFI school owners, Balfour Beatty, say use of their pitches has increased sevenfold. Not so, say this soccer club. And cost, they say, isn't the only problem. All of our activities are either in the evenings during the week or at the weekends. The company that run the pitch bookings work nine to five, Monday to Friday. So there's nobody to talk to. They don't have mobiles or anything of that sort? Uh, well, r rather amusingly, uh, we were refused um, the mobile numbers for the caretakers under the Data Protection Act, despite the fact that Belfort Beatty's uh, health and safety policy says we should contact them in the case of a, a first aid situation. What do you make of that? It's barking. Barking? Yes. The local MP agrees. In the past, you could go to the head teacher. The head teacher has no influence over the building and the use of facilities. Or you could go to the governors. They have no influence. The only people you can go to are the private company, the PFI contractor, who've got no interest whatsoever in discussing with the community, including with local MPs. They're in it to make money. Quite a lot of money, in fact. For two decades, private finance initiative projects have been quietly clocking up so far to a total of 300 billion pounds. 
They may not be household names, but they do form the backbone of our civic life. Nearly a thousand hospitals and schools now owned privately and with more PFI projects in the pipeline. In Liverpool, the local NHS wants a piece of this PFI action. They're desperate for a new hospital. The one they've got has been voted the ugliest building in the city. The Royal Liverpool is quite literally falling apart. Well, the ceiling panels are very interesting in this hospital because all you've got to do, wherever you are, is look above you and you'll see fingerprints on all of the panels. And that is because, for instance here, all of the facilities yeah. for our hospital, the water, yeah. the heating, the electricity, is all in the panels above, uh, above where you're walking. And things keep going wrong? Things go wrong constantly. Our facilities department, in one month, recorded 1,300 reactive maintenance calls, and that's leaks, electrical breakdowns, central heating breakdowns. A new hospital is going to cost over a billion pounds. But even in these cash-strapped times, Dr. Williams says it's urgently needed. We lost several theatres over Christmas. For three, four days, because of leaks, we couldn't actually use a number of Because you have to shut off a pipe to fix it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, the, the ceiling was covered in plastic, just plastic sheeting. Like almost every hospital built in the last decade, Liverpool has been encouraged to turn to the private finance initiative. Here's how the PFI world works. Private companies borrow the money to build the hospital, which they then own. They usually also clean and maintain it once it's opened. The NHS then pays them a 30-year mortgage to use it. Ministers like PFI because it works like a credit card. They buy now, we all pay later. It's very seductive politically. If you're the Prime Minister, well, you're the Prime Minister, I can get you to announce more new hospitals with this machine than, than, than you dreamed possible, and you like that. And uh, I do like it. Uh, I don't like it if it shows on my bank balance. It's your successor's bank balance, so you needn't worry. That does sound good, and some PFI projects have saved the taxpayer money. The M6 toll road was much needed, private money built it, and it earns its keep from motorists who choose to use it. Some very good infrastructure got built, there's no doubt. There's some very good infrastructure got built. It just got built at an enormous price. And the costs are piling up. The real story is the enormous additional cost that we as taxpayers have been paying in the tens of billions of pounds for public infrastructure uh, that was built over the last 15 years. And that, I'm afraid, is an outrage. The PFI credit card comes with some very tough terms and conditions. In fact, it's a very inflexible friend. Take this fire control center and eight others like it. All but one have been empty since they were built because the fire brigade don't want to use them after all. If the government owned these white elephants, they could at least sell them on or pull them down or anyway do something useful with the land. But you see, with PFI, you're stuck. A contract is a contract. And the owners are guaranteed an annual payment for a generation, whether the buildings are used or not. That contract means the owners collect nearly £40,000 a day in rent and maintenance on this herd of white elephants. At least half a billion will have been wasted by the end of the contract. Not exactly value for money. It's as though you went out and bought a plasma screen on a credit card rather than saving up for it. And the difference, unfortunately, with PFI is that that's a 25-year plasma screen repayment and if the amounts involved are tens or hundreds of billions of pounds overall that will be hanging over my children undoubtedly and and the children of all of us but for a few others pfi has been the goose that laid the golden egg 
Next stop on my journey around PFI Britain, an MP who says his hospitals had to learn some hard lessons about PFI. Too often there's been this sort of rather hazy, slightly dopey assumption that all will work out for the best in the best of all possible worlds, and that the private sector isn't out there to make a buck as quickly as it can. Opened in 2001, the Norfolk and Norwich was an early PFI hospital. The hospital wanted the contract rewritten to let them share in any windfall the new owners might make. We understand the Department of Health stopped this, apparently, because of Treasury policy. I think at the time they were very keen to attract the private sector in. It was the first sizable deal to come along, and I think they bent over backwards to attract the private sector. Sure enough, within two years, the owners, Octagon Healthcare, got a cheaper mortgage. And thanks to the taxpayer, they could write themselves a cheque for £116 million. After the deal had been done, I, I wrote to all the shareholders of, of Octagon, including Serco, who were a small shareholder at the time, and said, look, you've made a big gain. How about giving us a little bit of it um, to one of our charitable trusts? The only shareholder to respond was Serco, who still do the hospital maintenance and catering. Serco has become part of the hospital. I think for Octagon, perhaps inevitably, we are a contract, first and foremost. We're an income stream. After Octagon's windfall arrived, they did hand over 34 million to the hospital, but they still walked away with 82 million thanks to the taxpayer, money that could have been used to treat patients. You must have been kicking yourselves. Well, I, I hated seeing this money going over to these institutional investors when we could have used that money ourselves. Yeah, I hated it at the time. Hated them lining their pockets? They made a very good investment, didn't they? They were and, fleecing uh, you, weren't they? No, I don't think they were. I think fleecing is too pejorative. What word um, They made a very, very good investment. Mm. So who are the investors reaping these rewards? They rarely speak publicly. But this summer, MPs called the bosses of two of the major investment funds to account. One of them manages investments in 19 hospitals, including Norfolk and Norwich, run by Octagon over 260 schools and PFI defence contracts worth three billion. His name is David Mehta. The Daily Telegraph of the 28th of January reported you as getting pay and dividends of 8.6 million pounds last year. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. In an environment where um, the whole country's going through a tough time, here are you, paid more than the Chief Executive of the Royal Bank, Bank of Scotland. Look, can, can I have a and, and, and I haven't finished my question yet. David Mehta is the spokesman for the PFI industry. But like other PFI businessmen we approached, he didn't want to be interviewed by Panorama. Go to all these uh, hospitals and schools and railway lines and ask them the questions and say, you know, would you, do, do you think these work? And mostly, our public sector customers are very happy. When uh, David Mehta said, and I quote, I think UK PLC is getting an excellent deal, you agree with that? No. <laughs> I certainly don't agree with that. The best financial deal, without doubt, are the PFI investors. What uh, the public have got is um, hospitals and schools built that would otherwise not have been built. Not only built, insists Mr Meta, but on time and to budget. The argument is that what, if you allow the public sector to take control of these huge infrastructure projects, they, they don't know how to manage them. We end up paying a lot more. There's some truth in that, isn't there? Cheerleaders and critics of PFI can both cite the anecdotes they like. Uh, but what you, what you have to do is you have to look across the whole piece. Uh, and across the piece, its performance is, is not much better. That's the truth. On now to Bromley, South London. This government says that some PFI deals are pushing NHS trusts to the brink of financial collapse. PFI's chickens are coming home to roost. This is the Princess Royal Hospital in South London. It's another 
hospital project that's helped fill out the size of Mr. Mehta's wallet and the wallets of his fellow investors. Once again, Mr. Mehta and his fellow investors were able to take out a cash windfall, this time of 30 million. Today they're earning an average return on their investment of 70% every year. It is hugely excessive, um, uh, and re particularly relative to the risks that are being borne. Uh, this is an extremely high return. Mr. Mehta stresses the Princess Royal is not typical of most PFI deals, but that doesn't help the hospital. It's one of the most expensive PFIs in Britain. Repayments eat up a fifth of its income. The trust has debts of nearly 140 million and rising. The repayment on a PFI investment is a first call on your resources. So if you're running uh, a trust or a, a hospital trust or a school, you have to pay that before you pay any doctor, nurse, teacher or anything. The government department that's supposed to safeguard the interests of taxpayers is Her Majesty's Treasury. The PFI buck stops here. For years, the Treasury has claimed that despite the higher repayment costs of PFI, it's still value for money, especially because the private sector, not the public sector, has taken over the risk and the cost of the unknown. Really. For a hospital, one of the biggest risks over the lifetime of their PFI contract is inflation, now at 5%. PFI companies have protected themselves against inflation. But a panorama survey shows that hospitals are bearing the brunt of it. We contacted nearly all PFI hospitals in England. 89% confirmed they're locked into loan repayments, which rise fully with inflation. All this while the NHS is having to make unprecedented savings. It means you get fewer operations, fewer medicines, less care for every pound you spend. I think that there will be cuts in health services to patients to pay for the costs of the PFI deal. And that's a real, real concern. And it was a concern that was foreseen here at the Treasury. Hospitals were warned against locking themselves into contracts that were fully linked to inflation. So why didn't the Treasury stop them? Because, said the Treasury in a statement to Panorama, their role was to provide advice and guidance. And the guidance wasn't mandatory. What do you think overall of um, the Treasury's oversight role? I mean, do you think they've been vigilant enough? Uh, no, I certainly don't think they've been vigilant. I think they have been very partisan in the way they have overseen uh, the letting of PFI contracts. My next destination, Scotland. Despite the Treasury's claim that PFI is value for money, the full financial details are secret. But in Edinburgh, a husband and wife team has unearthed details the taxpayer was never meant to see. Dr. Jim Cuthbert is the former chief statistician at the Scottish office, and his wife Margaret is an economist. Projection then after of two percent. They've acquired the secret data for six projects that exposed the true cost of PFI. We found in a number of cases that they could actually have put up two hospitals mm. instead of the one that they were putting up. It would be wrong to give the impression that this is all rocket science and terribly complex. I think at the level of the ordinary person in the street, they fully understand what happens if in a credit card you don't pay up your interest and how the debt can escalate. The Cuthberts found that the hospitals had locked themselves into credit card style repayment regimes that generated big profits for the PFI companies. The true extent of such liabilities to the taxpayer don't show up on Britain's bank balance because they're charged to the PFI credit card. Is PFI basically dodgy accounting? Well, 
I do actually subscribe to the view that this was dodgy accounting. It's dodgy because it should have been transparent. This was a type of accountancy that was going to lead to grief in the economy. The Treasury insists that more recent PFI deals have offered taxpayers much better value for money. But have they really? Remember the Royal Liverpool Hospital, where the operating theatres are flooding and the buildings falling down? Like almost all other big hospital projects, Liverpool won't go ahead if the local NHS can't use the PFI credit card. There is no realistic public sector option for almost all of those schemes. There simply isn't the public capital available in the Department of Health to fund them. So from the point of view of the individual trust, they're looking at PFI as the only game in town. The Department of Health insists that they've done the sums for Liverpool and they show that PFI is the best value for money. However, we've obtained confidential government documents that suggest the calculations were manipulated in PFI's favour. The documents reveal that in December 2009, PFI was found to be significantly more expensive than if the government built the hospital. And that wasn't the answer that either the Trust or the Department of Health wanted. Knowing how these things are done, they must have been desperate. I mean, they must have used every telephone directory, spare dictionary to prop that PFI scheme up. Our confidential documents show that the sums were done again. Whereas four months earlier, the sums showed that PFI was more expensive, now they showed PFI was cheaper. Dirty secret is that everybody who approaches this exam and, and, and fills in their exam paper came to the exam no, knowing or believing in what the answer was already. We've looked at how the sums were redone. Even though the contract hadn't been tendered, the trust assumed the eventual winner would settle for lower profits than almost every other PFI deal. And even then, PFI only scraped home by a whisker, cheaper by just 0.03%. It's a, a spuriously precise result. The truth is that the, uh, the amount of uncertainty um, that relates to the assumptions that are being made here is so vast that such a small difference between the costs uh, of, of public procurement and a PFI are, are pretty meaningless. The decision whether to go with PFI really matters. Some believe that if the government built the hospital itself, it might save perhaps half a billion pounds, which could buy Liverpool 15 million pounds of extra healthcare every year for the next 34 years. 15 million at present prices would buy you uh, nearly 200 fully staffed beds or 500 nurses, clearly a lot of health care and it will seriously affect the health of Liverpool. Was Liverpool a fix? Yes, I believe so. And I think ministers should have asked some tough questions about this project. Tough questions, particularly because, as the confidential documents reveal, a warning by the Department of Health that the risk of the new hospital not being able to afford its PFI payments was significant. And yet the Health Secretary, Andrew Lansley, has recently given the thumbs up to Liverpool's PFI. Which is strange, because Andrew Lansley has been complaining loudly about how PFI has brought parts of the NHS to the brink of financial collapse. We wanted to ask him about the new hospital in Liverpool, but like everybody else in this programme with questions to answer, he didn't want to be interviewed. In statements to Panorama, the Department of Health and NHS Trust in Liverpool denied any manipulation of the calculations. It's not even clear we can, the hospital can actually afford it. Yeah. We showed our evidence to Margaret Hodge, the MP who heads the parliamentary committee that oversees value for money for taxpayers. I think Liverpool is a fix on the basis of those two documents that you showed me. Uh, and uh, that is bad decision making 
and that is not serving the interests of the taxpayer properly. If they want to build a hospital in Liverpool, and this is the only way they can build it, fine. But be transparent and open about the real costs to the taxpayer, to the health service, not just today, but over the 30-year life of that PFI deal. Perhaps the most puzzling question in all this is why did this country's economic elite, the Treasury, allow the private sector such latitude when it came to taxpayers' money? Many of the senior people the Treasury appointed to expand PFI and check any excess were themselves financial consultants and bankers whose firms have made millions from PFI. Back and forth they've gone between the Treasury and the city. Jeffrey Spence used to work for the bank HSBC. Now he's on his third stint at the Treasury. Richard Abadi came on secondment from the city accountants PwC and has since returned there. Charles Lloyd was also loaned out by PwC. He too has returned there. We've had more than one person in front of this committee whose job title was head of PFI policy, head of policy, mark you, mm in the Treasury, who was actually a secondee from one of the major accounting firms. And so you sort of set up this self-perpetuating industry of accountants, bankers, consultants and lawyers who've all got an interest in keeping the thing going. We wanted to talk to some of these former officials who've moved backwards and forwards between the Treasury and the city. Not, I stress, because of any suggestion of impropriety, because there is none. We wanted to hear their response to the growing criticism from all parties against PFI. But like everybody else, they didn't want to be interviewed, nor did Chancellor George Osborne, which is surprising. Why? Because in opposition, the Chancellor and his colleagues were scathing about PFI. No more hiding PFI and pension liabilities off the balance sheet. It's actually a bit of an accounting dodge. It's a way in which the government could pretend they're not borrowing money when they are. But in government, ministers have signed 34 PFI schemes already, with another 49 in the pipeline, billions more hidden on the PFI credit card. In opposition, all political parties tend to criticise PFI. Once in government, uh, parties tend to realise that uh, there isn't really a plan B. The Treasury recently announced a review of PFI. They told Panorama this would see the end of PFI as we know it. For many, this can't come too soon. I would disband the, the NHS PFI unit. I would drop a hydrogen bomb on it, yes. Drop a hydrogen bomb yes, on it? I would. In his mini-budget tomorrow, the Chancellor is expected to seek another 20 billion from the private sector for new projects. Criticising the PFI credit card in opposition is one thing. In office, resisting the temptation to keep using it may be quite another. Next week, secret shopping. Do supermarket price wars rarely save you money? It's not the best value. We investigate whether so-called deals actually cost you more. Coming up, get it good, get it fast and get it cheap. Ten items, ten hours and ten celebrity waxworks to dress for the young apprentice next here on One. And a feisty young bride-to-be copes with wedding plans and cystic fibrosis. Brand new Love on the Transplant list on BBC Three now.